are back with another edition of the Federalist Radio Hour. I'm your host, Ben Dominich. You can email the show as always at radio at thefederalist.com. Follow us on Twitter at FDRLST. Happy to be joined today by Alan Bakari. He's a, an investigative journalist for Breitbart News. He's also the author of a new book, Deleted, which he's going to talk to us about today as it relates to big tech and their influence on the coming election. Alan, thanks so much for taking the time to join me today. Hi, Ben. Thanks for the invite. Great to be on. So I know a little bit about your background. You've been at Breitbart for a while. How did you start out uh, covering this whole line of stories and paying attention to what was going on when it came to Silicon Valley and the influence that big tech was having on our politics? Well, I'd say one of the things that moved me to the right, because you know, as a teenager, I was a dumb liberal, as many teenagers were, but uh, one of the things that moved me to the right was the way internet freedom started to become eroded around 2014 and 2015. And I saw that this was really being driven by the sort of woke social justice warrior crowd, the same crowd that was also purging free speech on college campuses at the time. And uh, before the Trump election, it was sort of low level. You uh, had to be very plugged into the whole internet subcultures to notice the growing attack on free speech and the pressure that was being put on these platforms like Twitter and Reddit to sort of expand censorship and institute hate speech rules and regulations. I mean, it's hard to imagine now, but uh, before 2015, platforms like Twitter and Reddit and, and so on, they didn't really have uh, hate speech rules. I think it was not until 2013 that Twitter started bringing them in. Um, and Facebook had them, but they didn't really enforce them very much. The same with YouTube, you can more or less say what you wanted on those platforms. Um, so there was this genuine uh, environment of, uh, of online free speech, really unprecedented in human history, actually. And this was a time when people could go on the internet, all you need was a laptop and a mobile, and you had access to a global audience, and you could say more or less whatever you wanted. Uh, we never really experienced that in human history before. Information has always been controlled by gatekeepers, whether that's you know pu publishers or uh, broadcasters or radio hosts. But uh, the internet was something new because we suddenly had access to this platform, and that all started to be become eroded in 2013 and 2014 with the rise of the woke social justice warrior crowd. But of course, it all accelerated after 2016. And that's what the uh, what the book is about: how Silicon Valley responded to the Trump movement, how it accelerated its censorship, and has sort of destroyed internet freedom in the process. A lot of the time, they display uh, an attitude of naivete that basically says, you know, oh well, we're just trying to make uh, our platforms function better for our users and our customers. Uh, you know, we're just trying to uh, make for the best kind of conversation or something like that there's this whole facade that they have uh, that doesn't really engage with the truth of what they're doing. How much do you believe that they really buy their own hype, that they think of themselves not as the enemies of free thought or freedom of speech, but rather as, as people who are just, oh, you know, I'm just the nice community neighborhood organizer trying to make sure that everything, you know, is, is up to code and, and everything's safe and good and, and positive. Uh, they think of themselves as the heroes of their own story. Uh, what do you think is really going on in terms of their attitude toward all this? Oh, I, I don't buy that excuse they use for a second. I've got a, actually a whole chapter in the book called Plausible Deniability. Yes. They always, when they, when they, when they uh, you know, enhance their powers of censorship, they always cloak it in some sort of neutral sounding language, whether it's, you know, attacking hate speech or attacking misinformation or fake news. But the purpose is always to censor the right. And actually one of the things, my, one of the Facebook sources that I interviewed for the book tells me is that uh, all the efforts around so-called election integrity and so-called misinformation that Facebook instituted right after 2016, uh, coincident, coincidental timing, by the way, uh, that was all pushed by the most vocal anti-Trump people at the company and then they went on to lead those efforts. So the well has really been poisoned from the start. You know, they may clear these initiatives in neutral language, but they're not at all neutral. Mm -hmm. it, it seems like there is a, um, a real tension there though, because a lot of these folks, as you say, until recently, they really didn't uh, you know, engage in any of this behavior when it came to censoring what people were saying. They really let everybody run roughshod. And, and the conversations then 
you know, as much as you would occasionally have hate speech and the like crop up, actually seem to be relatively civil compared to what people are experiencing nowadays. Is this a situation where their own efforts to crack down have actually backfired on the, the platforms that they control? Well, I think uh, people blamed social media for the rise of partisanship, but actually partisanship was rising long before the rise of social media. So the fact that uh, the conversation seems nastier today, I, I think people unfairly blame social media platforms for that. That was a trend that you were seeing anyway. So I, I think that's happening despite social media's efforts to enforce civility or whatever, uh, not, not uh, because of anything social media is doing. But of course, you know, their enforcement of civility only goes one way. We saw with the uh, case of the Covington High School kids, uh, blue check verified celebrity Twitter users being allowed to say, you know, we should lock these kids in uh, in a schoolhouse and set it on fire. Uh, you know, that some of the tweets they had to delete, but uh, all those accounts were miraculously unbanned, um, got to keep their verified check marks. So the, uh, the civility enforcement only goes one way. The hate speech enforcement only goes one way. You know, remember Sarah Dion comparing white people to dogs pissing on fire hydrants or whatever it was. Not even asked to delete her tweets. And I uh, got a verified check mark right after that. So the uh, the rules are very clearly one sided. And I'll, 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 I'm sure there are some people in Silicon Valley who genuinely believe, uh, as you said, that this is just about creating a civil conversation and stopping harassment and all these, you know, objective sounding things. But uh, what makes it obvious to me that the true purpose is to control conversation and to control political discourse is the fact that none of the filters they've created on legal speech are opt out. You can't press a button and say, actually, no, I don't want to filter out harassment. I don't want to filter out hate speech. I don't want to filter out fake news. They have the technology for that. In fact, Google, since almost since it began, has always had that button in the top right corner, safe search. If you turn that button on, it'll filter out any obscene search results from your, uh, from your results. So they can absolutely institute that technology and give consumers maximum choice if they want, but they don't want to do it because they want to control the conversation. So it's, it seems fairly obvious to me this isn't about protecting consumers from nasty conversation, because if it was, they just give consumers the option to do that if they want. Uh, one of the things that I think we hear so often from uh, a lot of different poll data and, and research uh, is that Americans are worried not about their own news consumption, but about the consumption of others. We saw this most recently with some uh, uh, Gallup data, I believe, um, Pew data on this as well as kind of indicated that. And yet in my own experience, it's actually the people who are most frequently targeted uh, for this type of critique, those on the right, who have broad uh, media consumption habits that include the New York Times, NPR, you know, all of the major networks, et cetera, that basically if you're a news junkie and you're on the right, it's far harder to silo yourself um, to only read publications that agree with you uh, versus being someone on the left where it's, you actually have to work actively to seek out any kind of right of center voice because they certainly aren't provided in any of the publications uh, that you're likely to subscribe to. Big tech obviously promotes a lot of these publications. So when it comes to the ability of big tech to skew things, do you think that they uh, actively are creating a silo for a lot of Americans who are a little bit too much online, <laughs> you know, perhaps should stay, take a break and step away from Twitter in order to learn the real news about what's going on in the world? I think that's a, that's a good way to characterize it. So you've got, I think you've got three, uh, three broad groups of people. You've got the left, and I think the echo chamber is very robust on the internet for the left. As you said, it's very unlikely they'll come into contact with, uh, with right-wing sources. Uh, and that's a problem I think that's gotten worse since the censorship started because there are fewer right-wing sources now, so many have been banned. Um, then you have, I think, undecided voters, non-partisans, independents. And again, I think they're far more likely to encounter a CNN link or a New York Times link on a social media platform or on Google because those platforms actually promote those, those uh, news stories. Uh, the exception being Facebook. Facebook has a couple of right-wing sources in its trusted news list. Uh, Bright Body is one of them. Fox News is one of them. Um, I believe the Daily Wire is as well. 
but uh, again, just completely outnumbered by the left wing and the mainstream sources. Uh, so if you're undecided, if you're left wing, you're a lot less likely to come into contact with a right wing news source. Whereas, as you said, if you're conservative, you'll probably encounter left wing news sources, you'll encounter mainstream sources, simply because if you're on Twitter, that's what you'll see in the trending news tab more often than not. It'll be CNN, it'll be the Washington Post, it'll be the New York Times. If you search on Google, um, you're more likely to encounter the New York Times or CNN, even if, and this, this is the fascinating thing. So Google knows almost everything about us. It knows our interests, what, what we're searching for, what our political views are. But uh, even so, as a, as a conservative journalist for conservative publication, I found I'm more likely to encounter New York Times links in my Google searches than, uh, than Breitbart links, even though I work for the publication. So that really shows you uh, what, they're, what they're doing there. Um, but uh, this whole prioritization of the mainstream media on Facebook and Google and Twitter is a very, is, again, this is something that's accelerated so much after the last election. And you know, that's why the subtitle of my book is Big Tech's Battle to Erase the Trump Movement and Steal the Election, because they've really been, there's a lot of talk about voter fraud and how that could impact the election. Um, Trump goes after the mainstream media a lot, but uh, I think big tech has really been stealing the election for the past four years because they've been ensuring that those crucial undecided voters have just been completely, um, completely cited, completely uh, propagandized by just mainstream media links and their Google searches and trending news, trending topics. Um, and I think we're, we're seeing the effects of that because the polls, the polls right now far fewer undecided voters now today than there were at the same point in 2016. Voters have already made up their minds. Mm -hmm. And I think big tech has a lot to do with that. I want to talk a, a bit about the solutions that you might favor, but before we get into that, let's talk a bit about what you think big tech is really trying to do when it comes to 2016. The siloing off of these independent voters is obviously part of that, but there's also just blatant propaganda on the part of big tech that is, is really obvious. It's so, I mean, uh, there's that line from, uh, from the old uh, uh, John Cleese thing about how to irritate people. Uh, you know, it's like setting Julie Andrews on fire. It's irritating, but it's obvious, you know? And it's one of these things where, where you know, I, I, I opened up my Twitter app the other day and I didn't even know that uh, the president had, you know, posted something about uh, Virginia and Ralph Northam, my governor. Um, and, or I should say Bill Crystal's governor, since he helped uh, <laughs> elect him and give him money. Um, and, and, you know, Trump had said something about how Northam, you know, is in favor of, you know, uh, ab abortions up to and after birth or whatever. Uh, obviously referencing the, the interview, the infamous interview that caused so many problems for Ralph Northam before we found out about his other problems. <laughs> um, and the, the thing that comes up in the Twitter trending topics and that stays there for the bulk of my afternoon is CNN and CBS News, uh, you know, uh, fact check inaccurate Trump tweet about Ralph Northam on abortion. And it's like, I didn't even see the first story that would have been the, that, that would have been fact checked or, you know, the, the story about uh, the tweet, et cetera. And of course those fact checks are completely disingenuous and what you would expect from CNN and the like. Um, not actually reflecting what Northam said because it's so detestable. Uh, but it's one of these situations where when something like that happens for me, a high information voter, um, I wonder what that looks like for the low information voter. Um, and whether it's actually a situation where that propaganda is so blatant, uh, it, does it even really work? What do you think big tech is doing when it comes to promoting these type of narrative controlling storylines and is it even effective? Well, I think it's extremely effective and uh, quite insidious because uh, you think about the way we consume information and what sort of triggers our biased defense mechanisms. Mm -hmm. When we see a source that we think is clearly biased like CNN or uh, even Fox News, you know, Fox News, most people know is a conservative source. Uh, you know, we're gonna be skeptical in certain ways towards certain narratives. But if we see something from our friend on social media or from just a, a random influencer that we don't know or, uh, or a Google search or a set of Google search results, those sort of cognitive bias defense mechanisms aren't activated. And um, the really insidious thing isn't just about the, the, trending, the trending topics or even the, uh, the overt bands of Trump supporters, 
it's the way big tech can sort of turn down the volume on entire political movements. And the way it does that is by having all these categories for people, you know, trolling, abuse, harassment, hate speech, that, uh, lo that they have these things called quality scores for accounts. It's almost like China's social credit score. If your quality score goes down, you're not going to be appearing in people's feeds very often. You're not going to be appearing in searches, whereas uh, people who have a higher quality, a quality score will. And uh, the way they've defined, it, defined these terms, obviously, is very political. Uh, it's generally the Trump voters that fall into these categories and will get covertly suppressed. And by the way, this isn't coming from me. This is coming from people who worked for Twitter, who worked on these things. Uh, they, these are the people I interviewed for the book. Uh, so in a, in a sense, they've trained their algorithms. They've trained these uh, artificial intelligence systems to recognize people based on the kind of issues they talk about, the kind of links they share, the kind of accounts they follow. So if, if you're following an account that's been marked as a troll or a purveyor of hate speech, that's going to affect your hidden quality score as well. And it's going to push you down lower in the rankings. So that's really a formula, not just for censoring one or two people, but for censoring an entire political movements and making sure they never make that breakthrough where they're, where, where they're able to influence undecided people and people on the fence. And I think that's very, very powerful because again, when you're seeing something from, you know, ordinary Twitter users, ordinary Facebook users, you're going to find that a lot more persuasive than, uh, than a CNN or a Fox mm -hmm. article. But these big tech algorithms are making sure that the, uh, the people you're most likely to see in your feed are not going to be Trump supporters, they're not going to be conservatives, uh, unless you're a conservative yourself and are following these people. But of course, the critical thing is those undecided people, those on the fence people. The uh, yeah. cultivation of sources within Silicon Valley and the big tech community. I'm curious about how you've gone about it and how many of them have just come to you from within these communities to share the stories they have about what it's like on the inside. Uh, quite a lot of them have come to me. There was a real turning point during the James Damore scandal uh, when uh, a software engineer circulated a memo on intellectual uh, diversity and Google said there wasn't enough of it. There was too much political intolerance. People would get ostracized for uh, for disagreeing with the progressive narrative. And then of course he was fired for disagreeing with the progressive narrative. I think that was the uh, the breaking point for a lot of uh, uh, Google employees and even Facebook employees. That's when I started getting a lot of uh, my sources coming forward. Uh, it is a very courageous thing for these whistleblowers to come forward because you've got to keep in mind, they work for companies that are experts in tracking you and they track all their employees as well. So uh, it's it's quite amazing that we've got all these leaks from, from, uh, from inside Google, from inside Facebook that lift the lid on this stuff. Because you have to keep in mind, these companies are not subject to any transparency requirements. We have no real, uh, there's no real obligation on them to explain how the hate speech algorithm works or who's getting categorized as hate speech or how these, e how these algorithms even recognize hate speech to begin with. There's no requirements like that whatsoever. I know some Republicans have tried to introduce legislation to that effect, but of course, uh, you know, that hasn't really gone anywhere. And it probably won't while well, Democrats control the House. So we need those whistleblowers more than ever now, I think. What I mostly hear from Republicans is complaints about bias. What I mostly hear from Democrats is complaints about size or uh, uh, driving out uh, co competitors from the marketplace, um, monopoly and the type. What's the type of approach that you favor when it comes to these manners? And do you believe that, uh, that there's a reform uh, silver bullet of some kind that would result in better behavior on their part? Or is this something that we're going to have to just kind of go through step by step? Well, I think it's a shame that uh, the censorship issue has become so partisan because, you know, there are plenty of examples that I cite in my book of, you know, just non-political, non-partisan businesses just having their livelihoods completely crushed because of an algorithm change, because there's no, there's no requirement on Facebook or Instagram or YouTube to, uh, to give companies notice if they suddenly change their algorithm. So if you run an online business, you could be uh, destroyed overnight if one of these companies decides to suddenly switch up their, uh, their search algorithm or their newsfeed algorithm on you. So I think that's an issue that goes beyond politics. It's just a question of basic business fairness. It's also ridiculous that, you know, 
you could run a uh, if, if you run a uh, corner store and your uh, landlord decides to evict you for a spurious reason, they'll have to go through a legal due process first, right? You can take them to court if the, if the reason isn't sufficient. But if you run a, a Facebook page worth a million dollars or a YouTube channel worth a million dollars, you have no legal recourse whatsoever. So I think that's the way you can make the point in a nonpartisan way that might get some Democrats on board as well. Uh, as far as a silver bullet goes, I think the end game we should be aiming for with social media is, as I was saying earlier, just maximizing consumer choice. The standard should be that if you're going to impose a filter on constitutionally protected speech, on legal speech, then that filter has to be either opt in or opt out. Either way, consumers should be able to decide what gets filtered. So if you're going to filter hate speech or fake news or anything, people should be able to opt out of that. I think that should be industry-wide standard across social media. I think people are familiar with the idea of deleting message boards, of deleting you know particular corners of the internet uh, that uh, law enforcement or that society deems to be uh, you know unworthy in some way. Um, I think that people are less familiar with shadow banning and the kind of silencing that happens uh, that isn't out there front and center clear to people. You know, it's not an announcement that we've banned this or that. Uh, it's there is no announcement. It just goes away and you don't see it anymore. What have you found out about the methods that are used along those lines? Well, this goes back to what I was saying earlier about uh, turning down the volume on certain movements and quality scores. It all comes, I'll, I'll explain the quality score a little bit more. So originally, the, the, so every account on social media, whether it's Twitter or Facebook or even Uber or Lyft is going to have a certain quality score, and that determines how valuable your account is to that company and whether they want to prioritize your content over other people's. Uh, because we don't really know what goes into uh, what, what, what appears at the top of our feeds when we log into Facebook or when we log into Twitter. They decide that. The algorithms are a black box. They don't reveal it to us. But we know from, uh, from the sources I interviewed in this book that uh, a big part of that is the account's quality score. Uh, now, the reason those scores were developed was to separate real accounts from, uh, from fake accounts, from bots, from, um, uh, from spammers, from accounts that post unsafe links and things of that nature. But uh, recently, uh, these companies have been introducing these new politicized uh, criteria that, that uh, determine an account's quality score, hate speech, fake news, misinformation, and so on. And because of that, this is what drives the covert censorship. This is what, uh, this is what uh, causes entire movements to be suppressed without the members of the movements uh, even realizing it. And also, it's what causes uh, their opposites, you know, the progressives, to be amplified in social media. If you see the gap in retweets, between prominent progressive accounts and prominent conservative accounts. It's just massive. And I think that uh, that quality score and its relation to visibility on social media is a, big, uh, is a big part of that. What can individuals do to make sure that they are not being uh, silenced, that they're not having the volume turned down on what they're doing, uh, and that they themselves are equipped with the knowledge needed in order to push back against others who might be repeating the, the fake news that the silo favors? Well, I think uh, this election is going to be the real challenge there because there's no way to really get around it on these platforms at the moment. There's, if you're just posting on social media or on Facebook, or if you're writing articles and hoping they'll appear in Google search, then uh, you're not going to have much luck this election season because they've really pulled out all the stops to make sure that uh, undecided voters see as little conservative news or conservative opinion as possible. So this election in part is going to be a test of whether big tech can really swing an election. Uh, I certainly, um, based on what I've seen, they're gonna have it, they've had an enormous amount of uh, influence over political information over the past four years. They may have already stole the election in a sense because all of the, uh, all of the undecided voters have just suddenly disappeared over the past four years. I think big tech has a lot to do with that. But I think uh, if you're a Trump voter or conservative voter, you're going to have to think of how to get around these platforms. Just old school methods like, you know, emailing people you know to be undecided or on the fence, talking to people, texting people, 
uh, going door to door. It's going to be a battle really between the old school methods and the new school methods employed by social media, because uh, you have to remember all of these tech, <clears throat> all of these tech companies, everyone inside them reacted with utter dismay in 2016. They were just shocked and stunned like the rest of the political establishment, like the rest of the progressive bubble, they were stunned that Trump had won. And then there was the guilt. They felt guilty that they'd not done enough to stop him. And that guilt was fueled by the mainstream media, which uh, and Democrats and advocacy groups who blamed platforms like Facebook for Trump's win. So uh, the entire story of Silicon Valley over the past four years is how do they correct that? And that's why the initiatives against misinformation started. That's why the mis initiatives against election interference started. It's why the fact-checking initiative started. It's all been aimed at containing the Trump movement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You still consider yourself a libertarian? No, not at all. That's an unfortunate uh, part of Twitter. If you change your verified handle, uh, you uh, lose your verified check mark. And unfortunately, the verified check mark, while being very uh, uncool, is also important for impairing in searches and trending topics and things of that nature. So I'm uh, stuck with the libertarian handle for now, unfortunately. One of the things that I get caught into quite a lot, and I have my allies within the libertarian uh, think tanks, think tank space on this issue, um, though they have to, you know, be my allies quietly, um, is I get into all these debates where libertarians basically insist uh, no big corporation, no private corporation or their activity uh, can be deemed a threat to freedom of thought or speech because they're a private corporation. You don't have to put your stuff there. You don't have to put your videos on YouTube, your posts on Twitter, your pictures on Facebook or Instagram, et cetera. Uh, you know, they're just a private corporation and you're signing up and agreeing to their terms, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. My argument typically in response is, uh, you're engaging in a, a completely false perspective on these companies that suggests that they are competitive members of a marketplace as opposed to being a monopoly um, in so many different ways, particularly Google. I mean, I can buy uh, uh, some of the arguments as it relates to Facebook because we've seen you know different platforms go up and down, but Google and YouTube really do represent a monopoly. And so the idea that I can just contract with someone else is ludicrous. It's the same as saying that you know a state in which there's one major insurer and one major hospital system represents a free market. It does not. Uh, and so, you know, just just as you would be a critic of that situation where there is no competition, uh, where uh, competitors have been forced out or destroyed uh, by market players, you know, you can't make that claim within this space. That's the argument that I've made to uh, not convince a lot of libertarians, but it's it's what I truly believe. What is your own argument when talking to libertarians about why they should be concerned about all this? Well, that, that point about competition is a great one. And also um, the fact that both Apple and Google control, I think 99% of all smartphone operating systems worldwide, they can effectively shut out competing apps from their uh, from smartphones. Yeah. That's exactly what they did to Gab.com, the, uh, the free speech app. Um, the other point I'd make, and uh, I'm, I'm always surprised by uh, Libertarian's defense of Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. This is the law that allows tech companies to essentially censor with impunity. And uh, that is a government handout. That is a, uh, a privilege that no other type of company enjoys. You'd think that libertarians would be opposed to government handouts. Uh, now you can certainly make a case for some parts of section 230. You can say that, uh, well, without the, uh, the protection from liability for user generated content, social media wouldn't be allowed to exist. I think that's a fair argument. But it's not, it's only not a libertarian argument. Uh, it's saying that, you know, this industry needs, needs handouts to survive. Uh, I certainly think there's no defense of the section, the second liability protection in section 230, which is the one that says they can censor any type of objectionable content and that's fine. I think that was created at a time when people didn't predict that so many businesses and so many people's livelihoods would depend on Facebook or YouTube or Google. Um, and libertarians seem to have a problem with uh, with industry wide standards. I found, and uh, I don't think any any normal you know American would consider it acceptable for uh, landlords to be able to evict tenants because they don't like the color of their hat or because they don't like their political viewpoints. 
but uh, digital landlords who uh, are able to do that to your Facebook page, to your YouTube account, to, uh, to digital property that in many cases is far more valuable than physical property. Mm-hmm. That's an insane uh, situation, I think, for uh, businesses, for publishers to be in. Um, I think that's, uh, that's a situation that goes beyond, uh, beyond uh, partisan politics even. Is part of this that we have these old-fashioned views of the internet where the, uh, the, the land, the property that you are inhabiting, uh, was deemed far less essential than it is for many people now? I know whole people who exist thanks to Patreon or YouTube or these various you know, different uh, platforms that they use to process effectively their entire income or the majority of it. In other words, getting rid of Patreon now for some you know, active journalists or, or getting rid of their substack cuts off their ability to make an income, earn a living uh, versus a, a situation where it's kind of almost old fashioned. It's like, Oh, you're angry that your your web page got taken down. Oh, woe is you, you know, that sort of thing. It, it's kind of acting as if what these people paid to build didn't matter and that they didn't already, you know, invest the money in order to, you know, pay that rent or pay that lease uh, to uh, to uh, occupy that space. Um, if you think of if you think of a YouTube channel, for instance, as analogous to uh, you know a rental space that you've paid for and that you've uh, you, you know that kind of idea of eviction becomes a, a far more applicable to their situation uh, than if you're saying oh well you know you have no right to be in this place anyway. Right, I, I think we're moving towards the situation where you, as, and we saw that with COVID as well, where our livelihoods, our businesses, our jobs are dependent on access to these digital services. Mm-hmm. And again, all these laws were written, Section 230 and so on, back be- before there were these huge platforms that dominated everything. And the expectation was that everyone would have their own website. Well, that's not how the web has turned out. Instead of having our own websites, we have Patreon accounts, we have Twitter accounts, we have Facebook accounts that can be taken away or rendered unprofitable at any moment for any reason. And I think it's it's going as as this progresses and as more and more of our economic activity switches to the online space. I think this is going to become increasingly non uh, increasingly nonpartisan battle in that everyone is going to be living in fear of these tech companies, Democrats and Republicans. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, one of the examples I cite in my book is a website called uh, Little Things, which was a completely non political website. You know, they produce viral uh, content about you know cat pictures and dog pictures and so on. But when Facebook changed their algorithm, they overhauled it in, I think, uh, early 2018 or late 2017. Uh, that business, which had 100 employees, suddenly became unprofitable overnight. They had to fire all of their employees. And that's, uh, that's, we're going to see more and more examples like that. And I think they're going to be growing demand from both sides of the aisle to, uh, to fix the situation. If, if you had the opportunity yeah. to debate someone on this subject, who would you like that to be? Ooh, that's, a, that's an interesting uh, and uh, interesting uh, question. Uh, probably one of the uh, the libertarians, one of the uh, the, the Google funded ones, because they mm-hmm. they uh, they always have the uh, the weakest arguments. If I uh, well, if, if if your arguments are Google funded, then uh, they're not going to be very very strong. But um, uh, also also any uh, any Democrat who who sort of support who's supported and fueled the censorship over the past. Wait, wait, I'm giving you multiple answers. I'm going to, I'm going to settle on just one. Uh, I think the journalists, one of the journalists who sort of pushed for censorship, because one of the things we've seen over the past four years is this panic being fueled by journalists at CNN and BuzzFeed and when they, uh, and even News Corp. And when they don't get their way, they tend to whip up these sort of advertiser boycotts against the big tech companies until they get what they want. And uh, I think that's, that's outrageous. I think... Uh, Journalists in particular should be outraged by the rise of social media censorship, by the dependence that the, public, the publishing industry has on these tech companies, because we're in a situation now where journalists have to muzzle themselves to appease the tech giants if they don't want to be excluded from, uh, from having an audience. I mean, uh, you guys had this experience with, with your comments section mm-hmm. where you have, to, uh, you have to toe the line, otherwise Google will simply just get rid of you. Yeah. So I think I'd, I'd very much like to talk to, uh, to, to debate a, a mainstream journalist who uh, thinks that all this censorship and 
all this control by big tech companies is somehow a good thing. And, and I can say to our listeners, we actually are in like the, I think the fifth iteration now of our attempted comments redesign behind the scenes in order to pass muster in ways that I have to think that the New York Times didn't have to do. <laughs> so, um, Alan, thank you so much for taking the time to join me today. Your book is uh, deleted. Uh, people can find it wherever books are sold, including from the tech giants. Uh, so thank you. I appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today. Thanks, Ben. And yes, if you go to uh, deleted, book.com uh, you'll find a number of links one of them is amazon but uh, plenty of non uh, non-evil companies to choose from as well <laughs> excellent uh, i'm ben dominich you've been listening to another edition of the federalist radio hour we'll be back soon with more until then be lovers of freedom and anxious for the fray <laughs>